Do you love Guardians of the Galaxy? I know I do. And do you remember the wonderful, cool, awesome little ship that could, that had so much room inside of it that uh, you never, you know, had a worry as to, like, fitting everyone inside this little ship? The Milano? <laughs> That went for a really long time, surprisingly. Anyway, um, yeah, well, guess what? Guardians of the Galaxy 2, the Milano is gone. It's gone forever. It's destroyed, kaput. They left it on some planet in a wreck after, you know, the Nova Corps bothered to rebuild it. They just went ahead and blewed it up. And it's like, really? Really? I mean, that was Peter Quill's ship. That was his home. That was his little bit of freedom. That was his rusted out space clunker that, you know, he loved and he customized and, you know, that he bed dozens of women in. And, yeah, they destroy it. Um, so, all right. Um,. You've probably seen, like, all the previews. Most of you have probably already seen the movie, and some of you have probably gotten a lot of the spoilers, but let's get some of the real shockers out of the way. For those who haven't seen it yet and are waiting for it, and just kind of want the pain taken care of like a Band-Aid. All right, so we flash back to the 1970s when uh, Peter's mom is dating basically Kurt Russell. They they really did an interesting job of, of taking away some of uh, Russell's age digitally. Um, you know, they basically put some points on his face and then they de-aged him, kind of like in Tron Legacy with Jeff Bridges. All right. Not bad, right? Well, uh, they did an interesting job. They definitely did a good job of trying to sort of represent what the 70s was like for some people. The muscle cars, all that stuff. Uh, the long hair, that kind of thing. And, yeah, there's there's this interesting little MacGuffin. Uh, there's this MacGuffin. There are actually two MacGuffins introduced. The big MacGuffin is one that you completely forget about. It's this weird, glowing, plant-like thing that uh, Peter's dad, Kurt Russell, uh, shows Peter's mom out behind a Dairy Queen, of all things. And I don't know why they picked Dairy Queen other than cross-promotion, and also Dairy Queen is a business that would have been around back then. And it's one where the locations really haven't changed. Now, you'll have McDonald's that go out of business or Burger Kings that go out of business, but weirdly enough, Dairy Queens seem to have a certain permanence from where a lot of them are located. Uh, they tend to stay. And it's one of those weird things that they just have this longevity. Um, anyway, so... Getting all that out of the way, uh, we're introduced to our second MacGuffin when these, for lack of a better word, golden women, um, and it, it seems to be kind of a race of clones, I don't know, because they're all golden and they all kind of look the same. Anyway, they, uh, they decide that, you know, oh, well, we need the Guardians of the Galaxy to protect uh, these special batteries that we make that have like a huge amount of power well this is where you kind of get the opening scene uh, the or the opening credits rather uh, because it's all set to electric light orchestras uh, Mr. Blue Sky and all the while little tiny baby Groot is dancing around to the music and it's funny because we see that little baby Groot has, like, some... He, he doesn't realize how small he is. He's willing to take on 
any opponent. He's very foolhardy like that. And this is important to understand for later. Okay? It, it's an important character point for him. Um, so anyway, in a nutshell, uh, the batteries come back up later. All right? Getting away from all that, you have... It's basically like Red Letter Media said. You have, a, you have a character arc for every character. Every character has something that they're holding back that they need to come to terms with. Um, oh, geez. Like, uh, Peter has to sort of come to terms with, you know, feeling more connected to people. He's kind of let his guard down with his friends, the other Guardians of the Galaxy, but he still feels a bit at odds. You know, and it doesn't help that the queen of these golden women was hitting on him uh, shortly after they defeated this interdimensional monster thing. Anyway, um, yeah, the golden women turn out to be like... Well, they turn out to be neutral. Like, a lot of the characters turn out to be neutral. You have the Nova Corps, which is sort of a um, an ordered good, if you will. And then you have the Ravagers, which are sort of chaotic evil, and they shift to chaotic neutral. Well, one element here is that among the Ravagers, they've kind of gone this route to being chaotic uh, evil for a long time. And it's a huge problem because it doesn't work for them to necessarily be chaotic. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily work for them to be this chaotic, uh, evil force because they basically are pirates. And the original idea um, comes uh, of who they are comes forward at the very end in one of the closing credit scenes. And you have a lot of closing credit scenes that um, are very satisfying. You get a huge payoff, all right? I'm saying all right a lot. I don't know why. Anyway. So you have um, a really interesting cameo from Sylvester Stallone. Uh, you have Howard the Duck reappearing for some reason uh, in this film. I think just as a throwback to when we saw Howard the Duck at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, the first film. So... That was pretty interesting. They give him a bit more of a role. They make him talk. He's at a bar, telling jokes, listening to freight things go by. Anyway, um, yeah. So, Yandu has a larger character arc in this story. And I always thought it was interesting about the points around Yandu. Yandu had like a little it, it was interesting to me that at the start of Guardians of the Galaxy 1 they put him as Peter's grandfather who was going to take him away and he was going to go live with his grandfather well the grandfather was played by the same guy as Yandu so Yandu was clearly in disguise at the time and was going to just gradually break it to him hey your father you know was a spaceman and we're going to take you to him you know and you you get a little bit of backstory there as to why Yandu never delivered Peter and you know why it was different from that 
you have an entire plot story going on just with the Ravagers. Um, so, okay. Short, you know, shortly after uh, the Guardians get away from the Golden Women people, and Gamora is not happy that Peter went ahead and hit on their queen. For lack of a better word, she's their queen. Anyway, they, um, they get attacked by those same people because Rocket stole the batteries. So, of course, it ends up uh, causing them to crash on a planet and that's where the Milano gets destroyed. I was so upset by this because I liked the Milano. I was like, yeah, it's kind of clunky, but at the same time, you can get around in it. It's fun. It's yours. You know, it's got plenty of room for what you need. You can have fun in it. Anyway, all that being said, um... So it's there when they crash on the planet that, um, well, unfortunately, uh, the director writer gave uh, Peter's father one of the worst names since Cipher Rage. Uh, he gave he gave the father's he gave the father the name of Ego. Okay. Think about that for a minute. The father's name is Ego. Just gonna broadcast it right there, huh? You know, I, I really kind of wish that he, they had given him slightly a better name. Anyway, uh, so Ego comes down and is like, I'm your father and I'm here to take you back to uh, my world and everything. Well... Unfortunately, it all takes a very dark and sinister turn. Because Ego, it turns out, is evil. And he's not evil evil. Like, he thinks that he's doing good. And from his perspective, he is doing good. Because to him, organic life, mortal life, is unimportant. It's trivial because it comes and goes. You know, um, but the big shock that we get is that it was Ego who placed the tumor in Peter's mom's brain. So Ego killed Peter's mom. That is, Peter has the, the perfect reaction to it. You know, it's like, you know, you can do whatever to Peter or his friends, but you killed his mom. There is no point at which you're going to be walking away from that. Anyway, Peter has the perfect reaction and just shoots every charge he has in his gun at ego until he sees that ego basically can't be destroyed. Uh, and after that it's just this big huge build up climax to everything. Uh, ego is going to use uh, Peter's power to connect to various um, various glowing plants things that uh, he's planted on every planet with life on it in the galaxy so that he can just consume all of them and make all of them, you know, part of him. And it's... And we bring the batteries back in because they're the only thing powerful enough to destroy the ego. Well, okay. You have an entire character arc between and Gamora. I thought that was really cool. You didn't have any scenes involving Thanos, which was good because Thanos is not important to this story. You did see the Nova Corps 
home world, at least it seemed to be that, getting destroyed. You know, by this big amorphous blob thing that, um, that the, um, th that ego releases uh, from the flowers. So, that was kind of cool. Because that hints, well, maybe the the stone from the first film got released when all of that got destroyed. I thought that was pretty cool. All that aside, um, one of my biggest upsets was that in the process of rescuing Peter, we end up losing Yondu. And that's a shame. Because not only had Yandu finally kind of come into his own, but Yandu was really amazing. He was he was included in everything. There was a great cameo by Sylvester Stallone as one of the leaders of the Ravager clans. And it's kind of revealed that Yandu was part of this gang called the Ravagers, who were basically going around and taking things over. Well, they gradually went their separate ways and formed their own Ravager clans. And basically then they would go around tearing stuff up and stealing stuff, or in some cases being mercenaries, whatever. So it gets to be a little bit interesting because you're going to have another storyline eventually involving, you know, this larger Ravager, um, you know, group of clans. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the whole issue around Kurt Russell kind of having the beard, it made it so that the story kind of brought together a whole bunch of different elements. You know, I, when he turns out to be the planet that they're on, I get the sense of it being like the Gnome King from Return to Oz, the beard thing, and the end of the quest kind of makes one think of Star Trek V. But all that being said, is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 good? Yes. Does it have anything to do with the Infinity Wars? No. It has nothing to do with the Infinity Wars, and I think that's what I like most about it. It is its own story that is part of the Guardians of the Galaxy storyline. It's a sequel to that. You know, unlike... Um, unlike... Uh, Iron Man 2, or Iron Man 3 for that matter, where those were part of that storyline, but they had little hints here and there for other things like Captain America or, or Thor or, or other things. This was its own, because it's far removed from Earth. The most you have is Stan Lee standing around and boring uh, some aliens. So, in all, it's a good movie, it's a good continuation of the story, you have some awesome music, and I would recommend watching it. But if I had to give it a score out of five, which is my usual system, I would give it... Mm, see, this is the hard part. I'm trying to think if there was anything that I didn't like about it. And stylistically, it was actually better, far richer than the, um, the, than the first film. You had far more of a sense of different worlds, which was important. You had a very sequitur storyline where you had these different storylines that were introduced and they all came together properly the way that they should. No storyline was was tertiary. No scenes were um, were that you know out of place. 
Um, everything was in a decent proportion and balance. There was no area where there was way too much of one thing or other. And that's the real challenge in good storytelling. And I love to challenge directors, writers, producers to actually do good storytelling. Filmmaking is storytelling and good storytelling is a key component of all of this. In all of my criticisms I've tried to evaluate whether or not something is a good story. Uh, anyway, so how to summarize this. I would give it about a four and a half out of five. In some cases they go a little bit over the top with the silliness and the side comments and the jokes, but in many cases they're far more contiguous to the story than say a lot of those comedy films with um, Melissa McCarthy or Kristen Wiig where everything is improvised because all of that constant improvisation just stops the story for a minute so that comedians can goof around on camera and I hate that it's honestly one of my least favorite things so this film doesn't stop for that if I had to change anything I don't think there's anything I would change if there were any if there was any way for them to improve I think it actually would have been to make the film a bit longer um, it's a pretty long movie as it is it's over two hours long but just um, in all it's it's a lot of fun if you were to watch one and then the other back to back you would probably get a good sense of a continuing storyline I think I don't think you would get the sense that too long had passed or that these were different characters you you get the sense that these are the same characters there isn't a huge change and a lot of that is because they kept the same actors on uh, they kept the same writer or director on so everything feels very much the same without everything being recycled and I think that's important they managed to tell an advancing story that doesn't necessarily retread old ground too much you get much more of a comfortable sense of things I will say probably the only thing that I hold against it but it is important to the story so I understand why it's there is there's a scene where Groot has been made a Ravager he's been put in a little uniform and the other Ravagers are kicking him around you know he's ready to beat them up for you know being mean to him and don't you know what he can't take them all on he's just too little and that broke my heart because I love baby group I wouldn't want to mess with them but I do love baby group because baby group is just a wee little baby he's a little bit of baby group He's going to grow up to be a big Groot someday, but for right now, he's just a wee little guy. And there is one scene where Drax holds little baby Groot on his shoulder, and little baby Groot yawns and takes a little nap. And it's the most adorable thing you're ever going to see. But, yeah, watching little baby Groot get beat up was really hard. I, I had such a hard time. But it does have payoff. Because there is a scene where one of the guys who was beating him up gets comeuppance. And little baby Groot takes him out. And it's worth it. Because little baby Groot is still voiced by Vin Diesel, but they like pitched it way up and made it really a really tiny voice. So it's little tiny Vin Diesel's little baby Groot voice. And yeah, he, he goes, Run! goes after the bad guy, takes him out. And little baby Groot has his, um, has his purpose in the story being so tiny. He actually serves a purpose in that. 
So, it's kind of difficult to watch some scenes. I couldn't stand seeing the Milano destroyed. Because, obviously, if I'm going to go out and get a model of the ship, which I then had to put together slightly, and put, like, a kajillion stickers on, seriously, this was, like, the most labor-intensive sticker application or decal application. I think it's just stickers. Anyway, it's the most labor-intensive part that, to anything that I've ever done in terms of that. It's like you would not think you'd have to do all of that. You'd think they would just do that themselves or something. But no, you got to do it. Anyway, um, yeah, it broke my heart to see that because I really liked the Milano. I thought it was an awesome part of the first film, and I loved when they rebuilt it. But sometimes the ship has to be destroyed and it doesn't come back. And I think that's kind of... a It, it prepares you for what happens with Yondu later. And because he sacrifices himself. And it prepares you for other things. It, it, it brings home that sense of, every, of death being permanent, which is something that Ego talks a lot about. All of these mortal creatures are mortal, you know. And he says, Peter, you can live forever. You know, you don't have to be like them. You can be like me. You know, I'm going to live forever, and I'm going to make it so that everyone else, you know, is part of me, so that they live forever. You know, and I don't know, it's it's really problematic, it's really hard to watch. Um, because Ego is dark. Ego is like Cronus. Okay, we're looking at Greek myth here. Ego, Cronos uh, ate his children, and then Zeus um, fought Cronos and won, and all of the children came back out. So, like, Mars was there, and Athena was there, and all that. So, Zeus's brothers and sisters you know, went out from all that. Well, it's it, it, it's kind of that situation, and it was an interesting uh, connection to classical Greek myth. It gave it that sense of epicness, that maybe this myth was kind of based on, on this uh, entity. And I liked that, that there is the sense that Peter is basically a demigod, and so this is this is an interesting development in the story. Uh, then you have a little scene at the end where the golden women are back, and there's some kind of creature that's being made, and I don't, I I, I didn't quite catch what she said the name of the creature was going to be because obviously it's foreshadowing something. I don't know. It's kind of one of those things. You just have to go, okay, whatever that is. At any rate, um, my advice, totally check it out. It's absolutely worth it. Uh, you'll have a lot of fun. And if you're not careful, you just might learn something. Anyway, uh, so thanks for watching. If you want, you can support me on Patreon. Uh, you can also uh, like, subscribe, upvote, do whatever. But thanks again. Bye-bye.